Well, thanks for being here this morning. Uh, thank you, sweetie. Great job. After that, whatever I do will be a thorough disappointment for you. So just go ahead and prepare yourself. Um, anyway, Genesis chapter 22. To finish this series, we're going to go back to the beginning. Um, in, in a story that it puts the, the reader, the student, at a, at a bit of an internal conflict, if you will. But I hope by the end that, that you see the Lord's intention, as, as is His intention in all of our lives. I know we do want to thank you for your continued prayer. Um, uh, things could not be, not be any better, and you just please pray the Lord continues that. Um, anyway, we, we jump in the life of Abraham. Now, just to set the context a little bit, and I'm going to challenge you again. Anytime you read Scripture, put yourself in the character's position. What do they feel? What do they think? What do they see? What do they hear? Um, don't just read the Bible as though it's dead. It is God's living word. And just as you read a, a book or a story and you picture it being reality, this so much more is a reality. So again, just transcend to the character and uh, just picture. So what's happened here is Abraham and Sarah have prayed. Now they've tried by their own means to produce a family and it has certainly not gotten them any favor with the Lord. But at this point, he's over 100 years old um, when we picked the story up when Isaac is born. And uh, so I need you to see from the beginning that Isaac is kind of the symbol of God's favor, the symbol of God's miracle in Abraham's life. So you really got to, before you dive into this, jump into G Genesis 22, you got to put together that Abraham and Sarah have prayed for Isaac for as long as they can remember. They're old. They should not have had this child. And by God's miracle, his divine intervention, they did. And you can only imagine. You remember before your children how you prayed the Lord would bless you? And I guarantee you, anybody in here over 100 with a kid, a child that's young? No. Okay? So this is an exception. We were young, and we prayed for our children. We prayed that they would be healthy. And, man, we didn't pray uh, the Lord, Lord was showing his favor. He didn't. <laughs> anyway, so I had children, and man, when, when little Aiden showed up, I remember being in that hospital, and I remember holding him, and I remember thinking, oh my goodness gracious, Lord, you could not have been better to me. This is, this is, life is good, but this is better, right? And every time I've looked at him as he's grown, every time I've visited, watched, watched him just do his thing, it brings so much joy in the same of the other 14 that we have. It brings so much joy to my heart and so much pride to know God favored our prayer. How much more with Abraham and Sarah having prayed most of their life and then being blessed in such a miraculous fashion. So before we jump in here, need to understand Abraham and Isaac had a very special relationship. One uh, where, and you'll see the depth and the spiritual maturity of it as we go through the story, but Isaac was special, um, as special as you could ever imagine a child being. I mean, he represented God's favor and God's miracle upon their lives. So if you're in, in Genesis 22, uh, I know you just sat back down, but folks, moving's good for you. If you'd stand back up, and I'm going to read just a few verses here, and then we're going to jump in. After these things, it said, God tested Abraham. Now, you need to notice right up front, God did not hide his intention nor his process in this account. It said, God tested Abraham. So don't, don't be confused of whether or not God was testing him. He told you he was, okay? Here I am, he answered. Take your son, he said, this son that you have prayed for for so long, your only son Isaac, the one that you love so, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about when you get there. So Abraham got up early, he saddled his donkey and took, took with him his two young men and his son Isaac. He split wood for burnt offering and set out to go to the place God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham looked up and he saw the place in the distance. And Abraham said to his young men, Men, you stay here with the donkey. 
the boy and I will go over there to worship. Then we'll come back to you. You notice it was the plural pronoun there? We will, plural, come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the bone offering and laid it on his son Isaac so that he could carry it. In his hand, he took the fire and he took the knife and the two of them walked on together. Then Isaac spoke to his father, Abraham, Abraham and said, hey, hey dad, dad, um, yeah, what do you need, son? There's fire and there's wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, oh, son, God will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them kept walking. When they arrived at the place that God had told them about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he said. Do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. Abraham looked up, and he saw a ram caught in a thicket by its thorn. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it, offered it as a burnt offering in, the, in place of his son. Abraham named that place, the Lord will provide. So today it is said, it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. Then the, then the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, this is the Lord's declaration. Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your only son, I will indeed bless you. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word that serves as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord, you've told us to hide its words in our heart that we might not sin against you. Lord, I pray that after today, uh, we as your people are more equipped to live fearlessly to understand that there is no reason to be afraid of a trial. Lord, may you comfort and give your people, give us strength, and we'll give you the glory and the honor. Amen. You can be seated, friend. Well, this morning I want to talk about fearless through the difficult situations in life. You know, not, not a one of us are going to escape them. Abraham, I mean... Wow, what, what a man of God, what a man of faith, even though he did some really dumb stuff, just like we all do. Uh, certainly a man, when, when you're sitting back and saying, you know, because here's the deal with, with Christianity. We say living fearless, and there's one thing we fear more than anything is, is losing something, all right? And in this fear, you know, we, we play God to a capacity, but we cannot worship, we cannot put him in the place he's supposed to be in as long as there's fear. And in an effort to understand how to live fearlessly, look, you, you got to understand the story. The Lord didn't come to take anything away from you. He didn't come to harm you. I mean, the first thing I've heard some people say before is, well, Abraham must have really messed up because this is the Lord punishing him. That's not what it said at all. It didn't say... Abraham had misbehaved, so the Lord was going to beat him up a little bit, going to hurt. No, that's not what it said. Folks, do not interpret a trial as a punishment. A trial is designed by its nature. And in, so here's through the trial. you got every reason to be fearless, absolutely fearless, through whatever rests on the horizon because of these things. So let's go back to what Abraham knew. What Abraham knew is the Lord came to him, and it was obviously as apparent to Abraham as it is to you and I today, because it's described, Abraham, I'm going to test you. And this is how I'm going to test you. Now, you're taught to think that God is up there, and he's looking to hurt you, or discipline you, or, or take something from you. Friend, he cannot take anything from you he did not give you. Does that make sense? So the first place, the, the easiest way... To get to being fearless is to value God more than you value other things. Because your biggest fear in life is that you're going to lose something, right? Yeah, it is. Dad gum, I'm afraid. I, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm still figuring this, this faith thing out. 
They said, everything I got, I value. Man, I do. I, I love it. Whether it's my wife, my kids, my stuff. And so I live in a place where I try to also often live in a place where I'm controlling and protecting. And so I live for these things rather than just to trust him with him. I'm good with him handling my salvation because I know I can't handle that. But my stuff, I thought I had. I thought I could protect. And there's things I can't protect from. The only way I get to being fearless is to trust him. And so trials, nobody likes to talk about them. Nobody wants to go through them because you think in the process, I mean, look at the story of Abraham and Isaac. You would naturally assume, oh, how could God ever, how could he even ask Abraham to sacrifice his only son? How could he do that? Well, let me tell you how he could because you're not trusting God's heart. God's going to put you in a place intentionally. Listen, now this is just how much he loves you. He's going to put you in a place intentionally where you have to rid yourself of everything else but him. And it's in those, those times and places you feel God's heart. It's not when everything's going okay, friend. So count it all joy, Scripture says. Well, how do we do that? Well, understand trials always simplify life. Now, what you, what you do, what humanity has a tendency to do, what I do, is we take our little lives and we just complicate it as much as we possibly can. Worry about this, worry about this, bad relationship, good relationship, oh, finances, oh, work, I just, I'm miserable. We just keep piling on this thing, right? And, and the Lord allows tribulation and trial to come in. And when it comes in, friend, the first thing that happens is this complicated life that you have built completely falls apart. And you realize in just mere seconds those things that really genuinely matter. Abraham had stuff to take care of. I mean, he, he was a wealthy man. And I'm sure he was worried about a whole lot of things. He had a lot of things to take his attention. But in just one request, things become so simple. How many days with your spouse, your children, do we take for granted that one second can change? And we say, well... That's bad. No, it's not bad. It's not. Do you know how good life is when it's simple? When the only things that matter are those things that should matter? Keep going. Trials are overcome through worship. Okay, now this one's a little tougher. So we're in a situation of trial. So the Lord comes to Abraham and he says, Abraham, I know how much you love your son. I mean, you cherish him. You prayed for him, and I gave him to you. And if Abraham is anything like us, we value the possession of God's gift more than the process or the person who gave it to us. Does that make sense? And so the Lord's saying, Abraham, I know, I know how much you value him, so guess what? I'm going to ask you, I'm going to test you, I'm going to ask you to go and sacrifice him. And here's the things, here's the things Abraham knew. I love the Lord. I love my son, and I trust God. So this doesn't make any sense to me. Lord, why in the world would you ask me to do this? Why in the world would you bring me to this place? Abraham didn't really ask anything. Abraham said, all right. He called to his young men, get the donkeys ready. Isaac, get ready. We're about to go. We're, we are going to worship. Now you listen to me. Any time a trial comes into your life, two things happen. Either you become disappointed, disillusioned, alone and desperate. Or you learn to worship. That's the two products. Because you can't carry all of these concerns and then come to the altar and ask for the Lord's favor, His blessing, and His protection when you're holding all of this. Every one of us has this altar in our lives. Let's just go ahead. Get to number two. It is through our worship that we live fearlessly. 
So anytime this happens on the altar of our lives, and we, we say, well, we worship. No, 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 no. This is not worship. Coming to church doesn't count. Singing a song doesn't count. Some people say they only worship the hymns. No, a hymn or the style of music has nothing to do with your form or your ability to worship. Do you understand? Worship is something that happens between you and the Lord when you surrender everything you are, everything that means anything to you, and you recognize who He is and who He should be in your life. Does that make sense? Don't feed me that line of bull. If you think worship is a form of, Okay, or a style of expression. No. Worship is when you feel the most powerful presence that has ever been. And that's the presence of the Almighty, the Holy Spirit in your life. Well, preacher, I, I worship when I come to church and you've never worshipped. No. Wor- this, this, this is an expression of having worship. Friend, when the trials happen, coming to church doesn't help me. I'm sorry. Me leaving everything and getting all alone is the only place I find rest. Getting alone and just getting before the Lord and saying, Lord, I don't understand. I ain't got a clue. I don't like, I don't like it. They don't make sense to me. But you know what? I can't ask. You don't owe me an explanation. Now listen. Most of your issues with the Lord is that he's never told you why. Well, you need to understand and recognize he is God and he does not owe you an explanation. He does not exist for your permission. Do you understand that? Well, that's not the God I serve. Well, then you're going to split hell wide open i'm not being mean friend but you cannot change who god is you can't turn him into something you can manipulate and control so here's abraham abraham has been giving the most difficult task a parent could ever be given and abraham just says okay guys we're going to worship now the interesting story part of the story is that isaac had been with his father before And you're going to see Abraham had taught Isaac the right thing. Let me also explain. True worship requires everything. I can't hold anything back and be the Lord of any part of my life and kneel before him and pretend he's God. Does that make sense? It's It's inconsistent. For me to try to control and then trust? No. That's not consistent. And I've got also got to remember in my worship that he gave me everything that is good. And I've been entrusted to manage, not to possess. And so whether it's the, the wife, the kids, the possessions, the house, retirement, my health, whatever that is, your health, whatever that is, he's given it to me. It's his to do it as he wills. Now we see in Scripture it says the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But we can't stop there. Does anyone know what it says right after that? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Not just the Lord gives and he takes away. But blessed be his name. It's his. It's all he is. Living fearless. It's not me protecting anything. It's me putting everything on the altar and trusting him too. That's fearless. Folks, I can't do it. I tried. And you know you failed too. Only he can tend to the challenges, to the hurts of life. So sir, I worship. So the, Abraham's response to the trial wasn't to run. Now, let's just look at this. God came to Abraham, and he, he said, Abraham, I'm, I'm going to test you. I'm going to give you the hardest thing I could give you, and he did. And Abraham could have said, all right, Lord, I'm going to go to the mountain. Isaac, go get on the donkey. We're getting out of here. right? We're going to go as far away from God as we can because I'm not doing it. 
We're going to pretend like we love him, but we're going to go. No, Abraham did not do that. He said, get the donkeys together, get the wood, get the fire. Isaac, you know the things that we do when we go to worship. Every father in here needs to take note of that. Isaac knew what it was to go and make a sacrifice. Isaac knew what it was to go and to worship. So we, we can live fearless through our trials, through our worship, through his provision now. This is my favorite part of the story. So they get to the place the Lord had told them. And, and notice on here too, that or in here too, that they didn't know where they were going. Everybody wants to know where they're going. Lord, where are you sending me? Don't worry about that. All he said was, you go in this direction, and you go until I tell you to stop. And when I tell you to stop, you build an altar and you make a sacrifice, friend. You know exactly what direction you need to go in, correct? Come on, people, wake it up, right? You need, you're supposed to go in that direction, and you don't stop going the right direction until you get there. And guess what? He's not going to tell you to stop until you get there. Does that make sense? All right, wake it up. You're putting me to sleep looking at some of you. If you're not excited, don't come. So they start in a direction and they get there. And Abraham tells the guys, guys, y'all stay here with the donkey. Donkey, me and, me and Isaac, we're going on. We're going to go worship. And, and we will be back. So that's a, that's a context clue right into to Abraham's heart. Lord, I, I, I'm going to go in the direction you tell me until you tell me otherwise. This don't make no sense. But I trust your heart because I felt your love before. So Abraham and Isaac took up the stairs of a climb. Now, <laughs> Isaac gets a little into this. and Now, again, how old is Abraham? Over 100 years. And folks, I imagine when you get that old, you can forget things, right? Right? I imagine at some point you start forgetting stuff or getting confused. So Isaac's walking and he's taking an inventory, right? That young, sharp mind of his. And he's thinking, well, dad's got the wood on my back. He's got the knife. And he's got the fire. Bless his heart. He's over 100 years old. He forgot the... He forgot the ram. He forgot the lamb. Hey, Dad. Bless his heart. And you know the guys down with the donkey were thinking the same thing. <laughs> Look at those guys. Look at him. Bless his heart. He's lost it. You don't have the sacrifice. Don't tell him. Friend, when the Lord tells you to go and worship, don't, don't care what anybody else has got to say to you. And don't care about anybody else's assessment of you. It does, it does not matter how prepared you look to worship or how much it seems or does not seem you have everything together because I can assure you, as they watched Abraham go to make the sacrifice and he did not have a sacrifice in their understanding, that it looked rather unprepared. So, I see going along, he's like, hey, Dad, Dad, hey, hold on. You know, we've, we've done this a number of times, Dad, and normally we, we, we do the wood thing. Right, yeah, and we do the fire thing, and you do that knife thing, but normally we have something that we're going to burn a knife, right? And his dad just says, son, don't worry about it. All right, dad, okay, let's go. So they get up there. Now the whole time, now see the story, Isaac doesn't have a clue what's going on. Abraham knows exactly what he's supposed to do, but he's trusting the Lord to. So, it doesn't go into the detail about this part, but altar is normally built out of rocks. And so, they would have had to take an amount of time to build a, a platform of rocks. And so, Isaac was helping Dad, and, and they were building this. And you know, you always talk while you work, and you know the prayers that would have had to been going from Abraham's heart. God, my son is helping me build the altar that I'm going to sacrifice him on. Lord, what are you doing? It doesn't matter. I've got to trust you. I've got to trust you. So they get the rocks done and still nothing's changed. The command did not change. Abraham is still supposed to sacrifice his son. And so Abraham's got to be thinking here, Golly, when's the Lord going to change his mind 
Um, I tell you what we'll do. We'll just place the wood. Now, you can pile wood or you can place wood. Do you all understand that? I'm real particular about a fire and how we, I was in the Boy Scouts, how you place the wood. If I ever come to your house and you just pile wood to burn it, it's going to affect me a little bit because there's a way you place it so that it burns most effectively. Do you understand that? If you don't, you need to read about it. You need to study before you just go and build fires, people. Have some care. So he's strategically placing the wood almost as if he's procrastinating just a little bit. I mean, can't you imagine just being there? Can't you feel that tension? Well, I'm going to give the Lord a little bit more time to come through. What you need to understand in this story is that God never intended for Abraham to sacrifice a son. What Abraham needed to know, and this is tough, Abraham needed to know for himself. God already knew. He's sovereign. Abraham needed to see. Sometimes we need to see how strong our own faith is because we question our own faith so much. Am I strong enough? Well, sure you are. Sure you're strong enough. God's given you the ability to overcome any trial he's given you because, listen, that trial was specifically designed just for you. And he already knew you'd overcome or could overcome or he wouldn't have done it. It's kind of cruel to give someone a task they can't overcome, isn't it? And so they finally placed the wood. Now, let's go a little bit more into this story. We're not, we're not told about the conversation between Abraham and Isaac. So the, the wood is placed, and then it said he bound Isaac. Do you think that went real smooth? No. Again, don't, don't read the story dumb. Read the story with the, the brain the Lord gave you. Well, listen, I, there's been times I've, I've had to discipline our kids, and sometimes they're harder to catch than others. Does that make sense? So at some point, Isaac grew a brain, if you will. Dad, you remember, you, you remember back down the trail when I asked you about the sacrifice? We built the altar, and, and you got that wood. I mean, you were really particular about that wood. And what are you doing here? Well, he never fought him. Or it would have been a detail of the story that was inevitable. So what would have had to happen as a father being honest with a son? And dads, always tell your boys the truth. Your daughters, always answer their questions. I can't imagine a harder question for a child to ask their parents other than, are you about to kill me? But here's the beauty. Abraham had raised a man of God. And the young teenager Isaac was a love for his father, but also a love for his, sa- his God, his Savior, but also a trust in his God's heart. And so Abraham would have had to explain, son, I want you to know that you are a blessing to me. Your mother and I prayed for you for decades. And when you came into this world, my life changed. Every time I look at you, I'm reminded of how much I love your mother, of the times, that, the trials that we've been through. Every time I look at you, I, I've just, I'm reminded how much I love you. Every time I look at you, son, I'm reminded of how good God is. And that hasn't changed now either. So, son, this is what the Lord has told us to do. And so we're going to trust him. All right, Dad. So all we pick up is this Isaac was bound and he set him on the altar. You know, it never goes into some emotional display from Abraham. And we read in Scripture about emotion, a lot of accounts. Abraham never doubted it and he didn't question it. It says he grabbed the knife. Now, the Lord could have stopped this at any point. They could have been up the trail before Isaac asked the question. That, I mean, if you ask me, when should the Lord have intervened? It was when 
the, the little boy said, hey, Dad, what are we killing today? Because I wouldn't have wanted to lie. That would, that would have been the time. And Abraham didn't lie. He said the Lord will provide, and he did. But hindsight, that would have been the time. I mean, if like I was writing this thing, that's how I would have written it. But he didn't. He waited until Abraham raised that knife to finish. Everything else had been done. Why? Because that was the moment. That was the proof. You see, because of a lot of us pretend, listen, a lot of us pretend like we're going to be faithful, don't we? We start up the trail. Oh, God, forgive me. I'm going to be better. And we start up the trail, and somewhere we just quit. We build the altar, and then somewhere... We go back to who we always were. We place the wood, just drawing out as long, pushing as far away as we can that trial. The trial was not overcome until the knife was raised. Because listen, listen, Abraham did not need provision until the knife was raised. Isaac didn't need protection until the knife was raised. Friend, what did this trial teach Abraham? It taught Abraham that God would never. Because when the angel, the angel didn't say, okay, time out. You, you were for real, so never mind. No, 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 no. It, doesn't, it said, Abraham, you put the knife down and don't you touch the boy. Back away. Abraham You know it, as a father, he had spent so many days worrying about his son, his only son. The son that he prayed for for decades. Listen, catch it. And in that instance, Abraham saw that son is not protected by his father. That son is protected by his father. And then so all these days that Abraham had to worry, all that was gone. The trial to purify Abraham was that he would, he would love the Lord first and foremost and trust the Lord with everything else that mattered. You don't have to fear through the trial. I, friend, you don't have to fear. Through worship, you can overcome. But what I'm telling you is Abraham went to worship. He went to worship no matter, no matter how uncomfortable that was. He went and he built the altar to worship. He took his son to worship. He, they did what the Lord commanded to do. And the Lord provided. See, you look for provisions when you're headed up the trail. You want things to be so comfortable. You want them to be so easy and so convenient. You want to get up there and the altar already be made. No. Every one of us have an altar that represents our life. I can't build it for you. And you can't build it for me. I can't put anything on it for you. And you can't put anything on it for me. But on this, I must place worry and fear. Then you know you can't fear and trust God at the same time. I've got to allow him to put me through these trials. Abraham could have ran. He could have took off. And, you know, we don't know what would happen, but I guarantee the Lord's favor would not have followed Abraham. So here's Isaac. Now, look at the story. Look at the lesson for Isaac. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live, but it is Christ who lives within me. Isn't that what Scripture says about us, saints? So Isaac knew, man, I laid down here. I laid down to give my life. Listen, the wages of sin is, but the gift of God is through, yes. The story of Isaac is also the story of the gospel. Isaac, just like every one of us, should have died for our sins. And here's the story. If Abraham would have killed Isaac, friends, we're all going to die for the consequences of sin. And Isaac was a sacrifice for sin. But then the lamb, the ram, 
stepped in. And Isaac realized, the Lord won't let me die. For my sins, he provides the sacrifice. Oh, see, you first read this story, you're like, oh, how cruel. No, 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 no. There was no part of this story that was meant to be cruel. There's no part of the story that was not designed to show Abraham who he was. Isaac who he was and both of them who God is. Last, you get to the blessing. Friend, now most of us do not live with power because we've never worshipped. The Holy Spirit's presence is not in our lives. We've never stopped and recognized who he is. But not many of us live blessed either. And friend, you got to get through the trial to get to the blessing. You can't bail on the hardship. Does that make sense? The first time things get hard for, for church folks or Christian folks, man, we, we squirm and we squall. I did it. I do it. I get it. But here's what I got to say. I'm fearless. Because the one I serve provides the sacrifice. I'm fearless because the one I serve watches over my children when I can't. I'm fearless because I don't have anything to lose. Neither height nor depth. Right? Can separate me from his love. Fearless is not a head place. It's a heart place. So when I say, Lord, I've laid down my life on, on the altar. I don't want anything but you. I'm going to trust you with the rest of it. Because, friend, let me tell you again, everything I've tried to protect, I couldn't. And neither can you. Lord, teach us.